Well, welcome to World 101X, and today we're welcoming Michael Eyre, the Anthropology Museum Director here at the University of Queensland. So, welcome, Michael. Um, the first question I always ask is, what was your journey towards anthropology? What made you become an anthropologist and, and culminated in you being here, Museum Director? I think it, um, well, I guess partly goes back to the fact, two things, that, one that I wanted to work with Aboriginal history and culture. So I sort of made that decision probably around about the age of 20 years old when I was uh, uh, an apprentice working in a factory, in the sheet, in, in sheet metal factory, in the, in the making air conditioning ducting. Um, I'd finished school at the end of grade 10, with sort of low, low grade, so my education levels were low. So going to uni was a, a long way away from me, uh, from my, well, I guess from my, my sort of scope of where I thought I would be. And I think I was fortunate just to um, happen to end up at University of Queensland and walk into the Great Court at about 20 years old and look around and said, I want to go to this place one day. So I think that was the beginning of me dreaming I wanted to go to university. And a few years later, I was fortunate enough to, to actually get some um, work as an assistant sort of researcher here in the Anthropology Museum with Dr. Peter Lauer. And from there, I managed to get in, in, um, into university as an enrolled um, undergrad student. And what, what drove your desire to work with Aboriginal culture? I think um, growing up on the Gold Coast uh, with a, an Aboriginal mother and a, a non-Aboriginal father, um, I really experienced, I think that, I, I guess it was the era, you know, when I was growing up. Um, I was born in the 1960s and growing up in the 1970s. Just that, the whole ambiguity of being Aboriginal, it was something that was so many Aboriginal people were, were ashamed of. There was so much, you know, the real, a tail, I guess it was the tail end of, a, of an incredibly sort of racist, discriminatory period for Aboriginal period. And um, I'm not saying it's finished, but it was, a, you know, it was sort of a, an end of a, of a really tough period for a lot of Aboriginal people. And, um, and, I, and I was sort of looking around, you know, knowing that I'm Aboriginal, but knowing that I'm surrounded by Aboriginal family members, but it's something that I wasn't really taught about at school. There was no stories, you know, in the mainstream that really talked about life for someone like me, you know, so it was something that I just became, you know, interested in, in understanding Aboriginal history and, and, and I guess interested in wanting to be involved in telling Aboriginal stories. And, and what role did anthropology play there? Because anthropology in Australia doesn't have, has a history that is implicated in, in some of that racism you talked about. So as a discipline, there's a lot of soul searching in terms of how anthropology has dealt with Aboriginal history and culture. Well, when I enrolled, I guess, it might, you know, my priority was more to go to university and to lift my education standards to get a, you know, using the old term, a piece of paper that said I had a degree <laughs> so that I could hopefully secure work in the future, you know, in, in the Aboriginal cultural area. And, um, and because I had this contact here at the Anthropology Museum, um, so I guess it was this, I knew some of the, the lecturers here. So, so I guess the fit, perfect fit for me at that time was, was to enrol in, in, a, in anthropology and archaeology. And I think when I first arrived, my, my interest was really more in archaeology um, than anthropology. But, um, you know, as the courses was then, and I guess there's still an element of it today, that to enrol in archaeology, you were forced to do a, fair, a reasonable amount of anthropology and vice versa. So I was surrounded by students that were wanted to be one or the other and both complaining about they had to do, you know, they had to do the other. And, and for me, it, well, it was a bonus cause, um, because I really, in that time here as an undergrad, I lost interest in archaeology and, and develop, really well developed an interest in historic photos. So it was really more, you know, the, the, the interest in researching photos, but what I picked up from my archaeology training was, was the whole thing about systems, about it was just the era of the beginning of sort of computer databases being introduced. So the whole concept of, you know, mass storage systems, and I guess, you know, really museums, the whole concept of working in a museum, managing collections, search, researching collections, uh, putting numbers on things, putting things in the dated order. So I was really, you know, one of the great things I learned at university was, was I guess some basics about the philosophies of museums, 
the philosophies of sort of collecting institutions. And, and then that really helped me as a, you know, as a career researcher, well, here was he where I was heading as a career researcher with a main interest in researching photographs. So I sort of picked up all these basic skills that have enabled me to work you know, as a researcher with photographs for the last 30 or more years. And what a great segue into what you've been working on for this, for the last couple of decades, photography, right? Sort of visual anthropology. Um, can you give us an example of what, what stories a, pho a photograph can, can tell you? And, and can you explain some of the methodology that you use to kind of find out more about what the photo represents? Well, I think because I've worked so, you know, so, so much with photographs, I've been really fortunate to, in a sense, go into people's homes, look at their photographs collections, talk about what they have. And, and one of my sort of sayings is that, you know, everybody owns a museum. Any, anybody who owns a photo album, that, that, that album, you know, or, or a box of paperwork or research, you know, just a simple, you know, old biscuit tin or a shoe box full of paperwork or photographs, that's, that's their museum. And, and, and everybody can play a role in documenting history. And I guess as a professional, I've just, that's exactly what I've done. I've just taken it beyond the biscuit tin or the shoebox full of paperwork. So it's, um, and I think where I've been really lucky is to look at photographs and quite often photographs of people I'm related to or connected to, my family connected to in some, some way. And, and through the photograph, we'll talk about something that happened, may have happened in the 1920s or the 1930s or the 1940s. And, you know, I didn't know any of my grandparents. You know, my, my last surviving grandparent, my grandfather, died a few months after I was born. But through photographs and talking to old people who knew my grandparents, um, I get, you know, I've gotten to know them. And I've gotten to know, you know, all my grand, you know, many of my grandfather's cousins through photographs. Uh, ones that were alive and ones that were long, long deceased. I've just gotten to know them somehow. So. So to me, that's the, the great you know, honour I've had. Um, and then that goes further with whenever I do a project, to have somebody actually trust me with this, their life story. And they want me to put it on a wall or me to put it into a book. It really is a, you know, it, yeah, it's an important um, uh, position of, you know, that I'm in to, to have people trust me to tell their story. So you, you collect other people's biscuit tins of photographs and you go through them and you, you, you resurrect history in, 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 through the photographs. Um, and part of that project has been to document cultural performances and cultural um, um, engagement of Aboriginal people in, in Queensland specifically. Can you maybe tell us about two of those examples? Some of the pictures behind us are from the current exhibition here in the museum, Clan's History, but also there's um, an exhibition from a couple of years ago Wild Australia, which also speaks to this issue of cultural performance and, and the role f photographs play in actually documenting the history, but also what we can find out now in retrospect about what was going on and in, in different places. Well, I think that yeah, this exhibition, particularly the current exhibition now, Yarra Balala, talking about songs, it's, it's, it's a real modern look at the fact that we've now got this generation of young Aboriginal people in particular who are strong and confident Aboriginal people in a public sense and uh, the, much the content in this exhibition comes from the, the recent Clancestry events that have happened at the Queensland Performing Arts Centre. And, and it's, I mean there's such exciting image, imagery of, yeah, as I said, strong, confident generally younger, you know, they're basically, most of the virtue, everybody in the photos are all younger than me. It's sort of, so it is a younger generation of Aboriginal people that can sing and dance and, you know, strong, confident young men standing up in front of thousands of people singing traditional songs. And it's, and I look at that, the politics of that, it's something that didn't happen when I was young, particularly here in South East Queensland, particularly, you know, it was still, as I said, that, what I discussed before, that conservatism, that that era when people, you know, so many Aboriginal families were, well, just didn't have the opportunities to actually stand up publicly and talk about being Aboriginal. Yes, Aboriginal people were always proud of being Aboriginal, talked about being Aboriginal, but not, they didn't have a public, much of a public platform to do that. You know, if you look at the 60s and 70s, very few Aboriginal people had any real public voice. 
And that started the change in the 80s and the 90s. And, and I guess dance and performance um, is sort of overlap, you know, is parallels that. I, I'm seeing, you know, in the 1990s was this real flourishing of young Aboriginal dance groups, you know, and, and, and Aboriginal children going to school and learning traditional dance at school and leaving school and starting their own dance groups. And to this day, you know, many of them are professional performers. It's how they earn a living. So, so that really is a, a great story. And that's really what this exhibition is talking about. But it's also in contrast to a lot of the other work I've done. As I said, I was talking to my old, you know, all my older relatives and about particularly my family's history and then other families that may have ended up in missions or reserves, which is quite a bit different to my family's history. Um, you, 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 you're looking at this era where all people were concentrating on, you know, their lives were dominated by basically working hard, concentrating on sending their children to school, finding somewhere to live and basically just surviving, you know, within the non-Aboriginal society and not drawing attention to themselves and their Aboriginality. So, so it sort of sounds like a, a sad era when there was all this denial and shame. But to me, I'm always looking for the positives in that. In amongst that, there was this incredible retention of aspects of culture, incredible pride in the, the whole concept of Aboriginal family groups, the concept of people wanting and strategising to stay on their country surrounded by family. So, so I'm always looking for those, you know, important cultural stories that are in amongst that, that era where, where outsiders think there wasn't much happening with Aboriginal culture. So in fact, there's, there's this continuity, um, but perhaps a difference in audience, whereas the traditions were upheld in, in more private or within a, a group, now there's a flourishing of a, a more public engagement yeah. with songs and dance. But the lineages are there, and, and this project is in fact looking at different lineages of those songs and dances through different families and groups, right? Absolutely, and there's, there's, and there's elements of conflict as, you know, and, and disagreement as well where, um, the, you know, there's, there's some very public aspects of Aboriginal culture that have become quite commercialised. And, and some Aboriginal people aren't happy about that. They think, well, that's, that, looks good, you know, and, and in a sense it's this um, public performance that non-Aboriginal people think is wonderful, but certain Aboriginal people feel a, a disconnect from that. Mm. And, um, and I think, you know, as I said, look, virtually all the performers um, in South East Queensland today are generally all younger than me. So it's really asking the question, what, what does the older people older than me think about this younger generation that are expressing Aboriginality in one way that was different to how they expressed their Aboriginality or the conservative way they may have expressed their Aboriginality when they were young. So there's a generational uh, change in, in how cultural awareness and performance is, is, is lived, I guess. And, and these days, a lot of it commercialised or the, the ability of commercialisation that might have not existed before uh, has changed some of those, yeah. uh, those issues. And what, what role does a museum such as this and, and exhibitions such as this play in terms of your research, but also in terms of the, the, the public engagement of anthropology with this, this form of cultural expression? Well, I think going back to, say, the early 90s when I first started doing exhibitions and, and, and was fortunate, you know, working with the Queen's Museum to publish a, be involved in publishing a book um, that was came, released in 1993. And I look back at that era, that was, I was really, lucky, you know, really lucky to be at the forefront of, of Aboriginal people actually working with institutions and being in charge of projects and actually saying, well, this is how I want to, this is how I want to tell an Aboriginal story. And, um, and I remember when I did my, you know, first launched um, my first exhibition at the Queen's Museum, I think it was in 19, the first version of it was in 1991, inviting a lot of my older relatives to come to a big you know, big institution at South Brisbane, you know, the Quincy Museum. And here's my, you know, my mum's older cousins, my grandfather's cousins, seeing, you know, their parents, their stories up on the wall of a big cultural institution like that and how proud they were. So, so that's the, 
to me, that, that was just the beginning of me saying, wow, I love museums. I want to work in museums. I want, I want to see Aboriginal stories on the walls of museums. So I think this, the Anthropology Museum, is just a, you know, an example of, a, I guess, a, you know, a really brilliant place. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it is a, a small but prestigious you know, exhibition space. And anything, anything that, you know, well, not anything, but, you know, um, the stories that go on the walls do, do look important. And, you know, it's that prestige that, that a place like this can offer to, and legitimising stories. So it's about legitimacy, recognition, that, those kinds of issues. Um, but that still gives a lot of power to these institutions, um, such as university or, or, or a museum. And you think that's, that's an important aspect of, of what they represent to the broader public? those institutions? Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is power, you know, I mean, the institution in one sense is telling the story, but it's also, you know, an opportunity. It's, it's putting Aboriginal stories on the walls, brings Aboriginal people in, and it starts the discussion and it starts challenging, you know, how an Aboriginal story should be told. So, you know, and, that, and that's, that's really what, um, you know, my, the previous exhibition I, I curated here in this museum, the Relics to Rights, was telling that story of, of how, you know, in the middle of the 1900s, you know, Aboriginal history was completely controlled, essentially, by non-Aboriginal men. And then there's been, you know, each decade there's been a, a slow change. But really, you know, Aboriginal people, in, in any, any, way, any real way, didn't have any say over how our history was portrayed documented or portrayed by institutions until, say, the 1980s. And it wasn't until the 1990s that you've got the first, you know, generation of Aboriginal university graduates, like myself, graduating the end of, 19, uh, end of 1990. And I look around at so many other um, Aboriginal professionals in the arts and cultural industry today that did graduate, you know, in the, in the early 90s and, and continued since. But it was, you know, things really changed when you have a, a generation of graduates, you know, that then start, you know, seriously challenging institutions. I mean, the challenging of, institu of Aboriginal people challenging institutions and, and how Aboriginal stories were told it only, only really started in the 1980s. And then, as I said, it took that step further in the 1990s when Aboriginal people were actually taking being employed and, and in positions of, of influence. Hopefully taking over ownership of, of the institutions. Yeah. So I think that's that's really important aspect that a lot of these changes are very recent um, and are, are still, we're still undergoing those changes and they're not finished yet, hopefully. And you know, we're, so it's a process, an important process. And, and tied to that is also a question I was gonna ask you earlier, but I'll ask now about how you would define anthropology because I think anthropology also started out a lot of white men, you know, describing exotic others, and it's taken a long, long time for that to change. And a lot of those changes also only came in the 80s and 90s, really, in really challenging the institution um, of the discipline. So, how would you define anthropology? That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, for a long time, I've had a degree in anthropology but didn't always call myself an anthropologist. Um, I guess it's a bit hard not to call myself an anthropologist now that I'm employed in the anthropology department at a university and in director of an anthropology museum. Um, Why the reluctance? Um, I guess because of the, the connotations of, a, you know, of, of what anthropology represents. But to me, I guess the reason why I came to university and studied anthropology was, was really I just saw it as a as a way of, um, I guess, of, le of learning how to learn. You know, lifting my education standards so that I could could be a professional researcher and and had the skills to portray history and culture, and that's what it, that's what it's done. So, so I guess it is a you know I agree it is it's a problematic term, but it's um, you know it's um, I guess as the, sort of the definition of it you know anthropology studies society and and that's really what I'm you know what I spend my life doing without putting titles on it I'm I am continually studying the politics within Aboriginal society and sometimes people don't see the politics in lovely photos of people dancing or or photos of 
Aboriginal people working or, you know, or just smiling in front of the camera. Or, but, it's, but there's politics on, you know, who took the photo, where it was taken, when it was taken, you know, why it was taken. So, so to me, the, yeah, I guess, yeah, I do. I use anthropology to spend my whole life studying, you know, politics of society. So, so I don't know if that sums it up or not. I think that sums it up beautifully. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks for interviewing me. <laughs>